Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. Well, I trust it is well with your soul this morning and that you are trusting in the Lamb of God. What a precious uh, series of songs here this morning to be able to sing those things. Um, just by way of explanation to those that are viewing by television, um, we have a strange set in the background here, but we want to make sure that you're invited. We have our Vacation Bible School that's coming up, and uh, the children of our community are all welcome to that program, and so we want to make sure that you're here. But it's August, starts August 1st at 6.15 in the evening, and we hope that uh, it's a valuable time. It looks like it's going to be a tremendous opportunity for all of our kids here, but uh, it has no connection to the message, so we'll uh, just uh, by way of explanation to that. So, Well... I want to thank you for your thoughts and your prayers uh, over the course of this past week. Uh, 11 people from Rochester, 3 people from Duluth, 5 Wranglers from Montana, 2,288 miles in a shuttle, 3 new tires, it's okay, we got it, we made it, uh, 44 miles on foot, and 7 days later we are learning to trust God more today. We are... Uh, so thankful for the way that God has watched over us and taken care of us. It seemed like uh, as we went throughout this journey over the course of this past week, as we studied 2 Timothy, that every time uh, we expected everything to go well, that God would bring a series of new challenges to us. And that, I guess, has to do with endurance for us this week and uh, just the opportunity to grow in the strength and understanding of who he is. Um, on the way out there, on the way to, through, uh, to, we got to Fergus Falls. That's all the farther we got. And the shuttle just started shaking down the road. And I thought, what in the world is? I thought it was just really, really bad roads at first. And then it started getting worse. And I, so anyway, we pulled off in Fergus Falls and <clears throat> found a tire shop. And the guy said, this tire is completely rounded. It was, and it hadn't blown yet, and it, but it was really close. And so we... Uh, we said, well, what can you do about it? And he said, well, let me, we'll just put, you need to put a couple new tires on the front of this thing. I said, well, just take care of it. So he ended up calling around to five, six, seven different tire shops and couldn't find the tires that we needed. <laughs> and uh, finally, he found them at Fleet Farm, but we'd already been over at Fleet Farm. They were going to take five or six hours to uh, get our tires repaired. I said, I don't have that kind of time, you know, to wait around. We're not going to spend the night in Fergus Falls. But I said, we got to do what we got to do. But anyway, Bought the tires at Fleet Farm, brought them over to this guy. He put them on there, and we were back on the road. But what it told me was how, how difficult it was to find those tires. So on the way home, <clears throat> we, get, we were in Winnet, uh, Winnet, Montana, home of, had to be 128 people. I don't know. I mean, we're, we're five miles west of Winnet. We blew one of the uh, dually tires on the inside of the shuttle and uh, just moved our way into win it and I said uh, well sir I, I, ma'am I, I pulled up to the first shop do you have this tire I don't have anything like that and I'm like this is going to be good guys you got to start praying because we're going to be here for a while until we get a tire here she said try the tire shop down the road I'm like there's two tire shops in this town so we, we go to the next tire shop and he's like I don't have anything like that and I said well do you have any suggestions we're going to be here for a while and he says well hold on a second this guy, I ordered this tire for this guy on his trailer. He hasn't come by to pick it up. I, let me look at it. Just a second. He comes back. You guys are in luck. I have one tire. And I'm like, praise the Lord. Can't believe it. So anyway, he had the one tire that we needed to put on that shuttle. And I'm just saying, every time, I mean, all these things and all these events, not only just on the road trip on the way out there, but it's just an exercise in our faith and our confidence in God as he's watching over us. You know, we got wind of, as Pastor Gene said, of what happened in the Boundary Waters and our hearts going out to the people that were uh, injured and, and a part of what's going on up there this week. But you just say, God, you are going before us in every one of these decisions. You are always ahead of us <laughs> in all the things. You're always taking care of us. Even if we had been up in the Boundary Waters, would he be ahead of us? Would he be in front of us and taking care of us? You bet he would. And uh, we are just so thankful 
uh, for his watch care over us. And uh, I've invited five of the guys. We've split them up, so five of them are going to share in this service and five are going to share in the next service. But um, Pastor Lapine on his way to Florida right now to be with his dad and uh, family. And so continue to be in prayer for them. And uh, just the tremendous amount of burdens in the lives of people that are going on right now. We're just... Uh, we're just asking God to go before us, and we know that he is. And so uh, these guys and uh, some of the things that God has taught them, I'm going to ask them to come up right now and uh, just share uh, what God has put upon their hearts. So I've got uh, these three guys back here and Joel and, and Dr. Murray uh, to come up here and share uh, this morning. So come on up here, uh, guys, and uh, they've got uh, just some thoughts from this past week. Hopefully it kind of frames a little bit of what was going on in the course of our events as we headed out to Montana to the Bob Marshall Wilderness, and then uh, I've got some thoughts from our Bible study this week in 2 Timothy uh, for our message here this morning. Looks like you're first, Isaiah. Good job. Hello. <laughs> so, um, probably one thing I learned was endurance, and there's a physical side to endurance for sure. I mean, it's not exactly a cakewalk to walk 44 miles. And, and one of them was climbing, some of them were climbing a mountain. But there was also a major spiritual thing. And um, in Second Timothy, Paul compares the Christian life to a race. And in Second Timothy 4, 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And I just want to endure through my Christian life because I make mistakes, I get discouraged. But I want to endure to the end so I can say that. And that was one thing I came away with. I have a couple of verses. First John 15 through 17. Uh, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Uh, when I was out on this trip, I spent a lot of time reading my Bible and spending time with God, and I just realized that the things of this earth are really just not that important, and God is really important. Like the verse says, uh, the things of this wor world will are only temporary, and they'll pass away, but God is eternal and will be forever. So on our way home, we were all supposed to kind of come away with a verse, and that's kind of what those guys had been doing too. Um, and it's and we were in um, Second Timothy, and it was mainly about endurance, but. Um, Pastor Logan had said that the verse didn't really have to be involved in 2 Timothy, so it came away with one from Hebrews. Um, Hebrews 10.32 says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood your ground in great contest in the face of suffering. And um, obviously our trip was about endurance with the hiking 44 miles and uphill. And um, there were some struggles in finding campsites and getting semi-lost, but hopefully, and thankfully everything was okay. But um, the big thing that I found was that a lot of the times when you were looking down at the trail, you'd find yourself getting really frustrated and tired real quick. But then if you just look up and you see what the whole um, point of it was and what the whole goal was is to see the gorgeous mountains and to get closer to God. And um, it's kind of the same way with the race that you're running as a Christian. When it gets really hard, you're looking down and you're being all negative, but then you look up and you see what the ultimate goal was. And the, obviously the ultimate goal is to get to heaven and be with God. And It was a really good analogy that I, I thought, and that was kind of the biggest thing I came away with. All right, so yeah, um, like Connor said, we were, we were studying Second Timothy when we were out in, uh, out in the wilderness, and uh, Isaiah talked a little bit about endurance, and that's sort of a big theme in Second Timothy is endurance, and Paul's writing to Timothy and talking about like, past, like how Timothy needs to um, sort of step into uh, 
leadership and, and endure and live a life for God. And um, I just, I was thinking about like, well, you know, how do we as Christians uh, endure and how do we persevere and remain faithful? And we certainly, we, we have these promises, right, where we look to the end and we say, someday I know that uh, I, I can be in heaven, I can look forward to that. I know that there are things coming in the next life that'll make the hard things in this life worthwhile, but I think also maybe, um, you know, something, something that uh, maybe we miss sometimes is, is, you know, like there's a lot of joy in the journey right now. And I think that's something that I'm learning a lot about is like just how do I have joy in my life? And uh, John 17, uh, verse 13, uh, Jesus says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. And so he's talking about like, man, as Christians, we are supposed to have joy. And this one day we were hiking, um, we were hiking up this big mountain, right? And so you get to the top, and when you get to the top of the mountain, you look around and it's easy to say, wow, I, I see God when I'm up here on top of the mountain, right? But a lot of times, you know, in the valleys of life, we, we're not as open, we're not as awake to what God is doing, and we sort of close our eyes to the supernatural. Um, but none of us can live on the mountaintop, and so in order to persevere, we have to learn how to have joy and how to see God when we walk through the valleys. And um, I, think, I think a big part of it for me is just kind of saying, okay, well, if I have to live in the normal, in the everyday, then I want, I want that to be some, some um, I want to use that, I want, I want my life to be, even when it's normal and even when it's every day, I still want it to be, uh, like, like, I still want to be focused on the supernatural, I still want to be focused on what God is doing, um, and I just think, like, waking up every day and just saying, you know, like, how is God going to use today, how is he going to use me today to love other people and to pour into other people's lives, and just finding joy in that so that I can learn to persevere. I think that's kind of the big takeaway for me. So I too found it quite an, uh, an endurance test, especially keeping up with these young ones. And one of the goals that I had along was, like Logan was talking about before we left, about passing the baton on to the next generation, being an example for these, these young guys. So every morning I decided I'd write a psalm. I wrote four psalms. I'm not going to read all of them, but I'm going to read the one that I wrote after the day that we hiked up this mountain. We went up this, this huge mountain, 3,700 feet, came back down. It was an exhausting day, and at the end of that day, I wrote this psalm, and I'll read this to you. It kind of embodies what I was feeling for that day. Uh, The Lord called me on a journey. He said, follow me to the end of the trail. So with zeal I started the walk, but many trials made me balk. Faithfulness, the master said, is the key to your pace. Younger ones did join the journey. Their zeal quickened the pace. Should I run after these? No, said the master. Faithfulness is the key. The young ones scurried on, dangerous shortcuts they did take. No, said the master, faithfulness is what it takes. I'm feeling old and tired, many steps I have taken for thee. How long must I be faithful? Can't I just rest here? I've come a long way, and the view is pretty here. No, said the master, I have much more in store. Remember the faithful ones like Daniel, who pushed all the way to the eternal shore. Be an example for the young ones. Keep pressing to the end. So long did I walk with the master. He never left my side. Until one day I saw the trail's end. Its beauty I did not comprehend. Thank you, my master, my faithful guide. I do not regret the pain in each stride. Yes, faithfulness is the key. So walk with spiritual eyes. Dear young ones, keep on the path. The end is not far. At the end of the trail, the Lord is waiting there with rewards beyond compare. Thank you, guys. I don't know how to describe what we saw that day. There are no words. I grew up in Montana and uh, just over on the other side of the mountains there. And uh, just the glory of God to behold and see his beauty in there and to know that uh, what we saw there 
is just temporary. I, I mean, all of the magnificence that you look out upon, you see it and you say, this is all going to fade away. We sang a song about that just a few minutes ago. It's all going to diminish and fade away. And yet God gives it to us as an illustration, as a window of something that we can grab a hold of to say there is, there's, a, there's an idea of transcendence that he puts within us to say there is so much more. <laughs> and God uh, has put eternity, the aspect of eternity, right within our hearts. And uh, it was absolutely magnificent. I'm, I'm sorry I don't have pictures for you this morning. I had a couple of them, but my PowerPoint crashed right before I came here. And like I said, every time I think and expect that everything's going to go smoothly this week, uh, God seems to bring a new challenge uh, our way. So whether that's technology or whatever it happens to be, God is, uh, is teaching all of us. But we're going to be at 2 Timothy uh, here this morning. <clears throat> and uh, a couple weeks ago, I gave you a flyover view, if you were here with us that evening. I gave you a little bit of a flyover view of 2 Timothy. And, and the reason I'm, I am coming to love this book as probably one of my favorite books of the Bible is because this is Paul's last penned words that we have in Scripture. These last words that he writes... He's writing them to this young rising leader, as Josiah said, to, to young Timothy. And he's charging him to hold on, to endure with the reality that difficult times are ahead. Do you feel that in this culture in which we live? There are difficult times ahead. There are hard times coming. And, and Paul is warning Timothy to say, listen, buddy, there, there are hard times coming. How are you going to make it through? What, what are you going to hold on to in order to get through this thing? Who do you hold on to? How do you hold on? What is it going to take to, to grab a hold of this so that it can thrust you through those difficult times with your hope and your eyes set on what is most important? And so in chapter 1, of this book, just the quick fly overview here, you have the subject of faith. You have the subject of faith. He says, I remind you in verse 6 to keep ablaze the gift of God that is in you. And then he says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And then he gives, comes down to verse 13 and he tells young Timothy, he tell, tell young uh, Timothy to hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you have heard from me and the faith, that are in Je the faith that is in you in Jesus Christ. There's this idea of faith and holding on to what he has learned and what he has grown up to and the importance of being exposed to the truth and to know and to understand it in your mind. Then you get to chapter 2 and you have this subject of purity. And there's a, there's a fantastic illustration at the beginning there that, that it's going to be the context of our message. But he comes towards the end of the chapter in verse uh, 21 and following. And if anyone purifies himself with anything dishonorable, he will be spe a special instrument set apart and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. And then he tells Timothy, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness and faith and love and peace along with those that call out of the Lord, on the Lord out of a pure heart. And the subject of purity and how important it is in, in the aspect of enduring. In chapter 3, he talks about the difficult times ahead and he says, what is it that you're going to cling to? He says in verse 14, as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly, firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from a child you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom to salvation and faith in Jesus Christ. And then he tells you that scripture is profitable for doctrine and reproof and for correction and for instruction in righteousness. He tells us all the benefits that we have in the word of God and in scripture. And he's saying you've learned these things from the time that you were a child. Hold on to scripture. So you have the context of scripture. And in chapter 4, you have the context of ministry. And uh, this is where he kind of climaxes the whole book and he comes to summarize everything that he's saying when he gets down. Uh, verse two, he says, proclaim the message and persist in it whether it is convenient or not. <laughs> and then he comes down to verse five, which I think is the key verse of this book. If he has to summarize all that he is saying to young Timothy, I think it pinnacles at this point he says be serious as for you Timothy be serious about everything endure hardship do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry and then he tells Timothy 
I'm about to die. I'm being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is close. And he says, listen, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. And there's reserved for me in the future a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day that he returns, not only to me, but to all who love his appearing. That's to you and me, friends. That's to those of you that know Jesus and you are living in anticipation of the return of Jesus. He says there's a crown of righteousness to those that, that, have, that fight well, that live well, that race well, that finish well. Press on. Hold on to the baton. Don't drop it. And the illustrations throughout the book are these individuals. There's examples, bad examples of individuals that drop the baton and mess up. They, they mess up in the areas of purity. They mess up in, in uh, holding on to the doctrine and the truths of Scripture. They, and they drop the baton. And what's at stake when that happens? What is at stake when you and I are holding on to the baton and we drop it? We're disqualified from the race and the future generation of people that are following and that are watching us are out of the race. They don't ever hear the gospel. They don't ever hear the truths. They don't ever have, they don't know who to look to to cling to the truths and the, the word of God and to have the example that is before them. And so Paul is just urging Timothy as a leader, please, please hold on to the baton. Do not drop it. Do you know how serious it is to drop the baton? Don't do it. Don't do it. And so he uses all these examples uh, to pour into young Timothy how important it is uh, to fight the good fight as a soldier, to finish the race as an athlete, and to keep the faith as a farmer. And so back in chapter 2, you have that illustration, but I think he's tying it. It hit me in the, in the shuttle on the way home yesterday. He says, I fought the good fight. And he's using the illustration from chapter 2 as a soldier in chapter 2, verse 3. And then he says, I finished the race. And he's using the illustration of an athlete as he does in chapter 2 and verse 5, the athlete. And then he uses the illustration of keeping the faith as a farmer in chapter 2 and verse 6. He's tying all this back together and helping us to realize how important it is to, one, fight the good fight as a soldier, Two, finish the race as an athlete. And three, keep the faith as a farmer. As you, let me read over this passage with you in 2 Timothy chapter 2 uh, this morning. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10 and then uh, help us to realize a little bit how important it is to endure, to endure in hardship. Understanding that difficulties are coming, understanding that hardships are coming, how is it that I'm going to be able to press on? He says to Timothy, you therefore, my son, be strong. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, what does he tell him to do? Pass on the baton. Commit to faithful men who will be able to teach other people also. Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the recruiter. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to share in the crops. Consider what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Keep your attention on Jesus, who has risen from the dead, he descended from David, and this is according to my gospel. I suffer for it to the point of being bound like a criminal, but God's message is not bound. And that is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy. Commit to faithful men. Pass on the baton. And then he tells them to share in the suffering. There is a body of believers that we are, we are, we are here with. You, you have brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ right here. And there's going to be hard times ahead. There's going to be difficult times ahead. But we share in the suffering. We don't avoid the suffering. We share in the suffering. The difficult times and the trials that are there, we uphold one another as we go through these things and we help one another. 
He says in chapter 3 and verse 12, all who want to live godly will suffer persecution. If your desire is to be godly, if your desire is to live for God and to be like Jesus, there are hard times coming. It wasn't meant to be an easy road. It wasn't meant to be an easy path. It wasn't meant to be comfortable. The whole idea that Paul is sharing with Timothy in this book is the Christian life isn't meant to be easy. It's meant to endure. And if you endure, you will endure it with joy. You can learn to see joy as you move through these things and see other people respond to faith in Jesus Christ as they come to know him as Savior and they join in the journey and in the path with you. And so then he gives us these three illustrations of the soldier and the athlete and the farmer and he says, keep your attention on Jesus. Keep your focus on the Lord. If you want to know how to endure, the most important aspect of enduring is keeping your eyes on Jesus. That's how you're going to be able to make it through. And he tells us why he endures. He endures because there are people that are lost that need to hear the gospel. There are people that, that are on their way to hell that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm telling you, it is worth it to press on. It is worth it to endure. And so what I discovered this week is that endurance has everything to do with paying attention without distraction to what God is doing in and through my life in the midst of challenges. When challenges come, how do I endure? How can I stop from avoiding the problem and how do I endure through it and see God's hand at work in the midst of those trials and in those hardships? Heading into uh, the wilderness, um, many of you have seen it on the prayer chain, but my father uh, is uh, undergoing a series of, of treatments right now, radiation treatments, uh, and the cancer from, that we were talking about a couple of years ago from prostate cancer that they thought they had eliminated has now uh, spread out into his spine and into several other places, and we're, uh, we're concerned about that. Um, it's not an easy thing to walk through, but all these things are on my mind as we head out into the wilderness and we're thinking, God, what are you doing here? You know, the challenges that start to face each and every one of us, we, we start to think, uh, God, where are you in the midst of this? I mean, you, you can't do this to me, right? As if this is, all, if this is, as if this is all about me, right? Um, and so you just walk through these challenges and some of you are walking through even greater challenges uh, than that. And uh, so many things that are going on in our lives. And the verse that he gave me, God has not given us a spirit of fear, he said in 2 Timothy chapter one. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us what? He's given us the spirit, the spirit of power and of love and of self-control, the Holy Spirit of God. And he says, I am not ashamed because I know the one whom I believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep or to guard that which he's entrusted to me until that day. Hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you've heard from me in the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus and guard through the Holy Spirit who lives in you the good thing that is entrusted to you. What are we holding on to? How do we have hope in the midst of the crisis of life and the problems and the difficulties and challenges of life? And listen, friends, the challenges of life aren't always cancer and big problems. The challenges of life are just the little things of life and how we start to respond to those little illustrations of life. And yet sometimes we become afraid. And so he gives us the first illustration. Fight as a soldier. The fight of a soldier. And the question is, what's going on in your mind? Because the battle that a soldier faces, most of the battle that a soldier engages in is a battle of the mind, isn't it? It's what's going on in his head. What is he afraid of? And how does he learn to control that so that he can continue to think clearly and to move ahead and to stay true to his mission and stay focused on the task? How does a soldier harness that and have the confidence that Paul did when he said, I am not ashamed because I know the one whom I believed. I know who my recruiter is. I know who I'm fighting to please and to honor. And it's not me. It's not the other people around me. I know who I'm supposed to be pleasing. And it's my master. It's the master commander, right? It's him that I'm supposed to be pleasing and honoring. But what do we get afraid of? 
All of a sudden, these fears start calling. What will happen if I, if I lose so-and-so, if, if they pass? What will happen if I lose control of this particular situation as we're out there? What will happen if we get lost? The first day we're out there in the, in the we're, it took forever to get out. I mean, you, to, to pack up 15 horses and help them get 15 horses packed up and then for us to hit the trail, I think it was one o'clock or something before we hit the trail and I'm thinking, we have like a 12 mile hike and we've got packs on. It's going to be late <laughs> when we get in. And so uh, we got them to a certain point where they could kind of finish and I said, we're going to hit the trail. So we hit the trail and took off and left and went down uh, and we hiked and hiked and all day long my expectation was one of these times I'm going to turn around and the horses are going to pass us, right? We're passing along, passing along. It's 8.30 at night and we have not seen the horses and the sun's going down. And uh, so I'll continue that illustration here in just a second. But uh, the reality was all these expectations that I had in my mind of how things are supposed to go, God's just saying, no, here's a new little challenge for you. What are you going to do with this one? You know, all these expectations that I have in my mind of, of how things are supposed to go and how smoothly they're supposed to go so that everything is nice and comfortable. Right? That's our aim, our mechanism in our life is to try and figure out how to make sure that things are guaranteed to be comfortable. Um, in light of last year's events, we're thinking, okay, we got to make sure we pack all the right stuff. And Dave and I are brainstorming all the first aid stuff that we need, you know, for this trip here. And uh, he's like, I'll bring us. And I'm going to, we did training videos with the guys on the way out there and showed them how to, how to do stitches on oranges. We showed them how to do, we didn't have to use any of that stuff. God didn't need any of that, right? But we, we know how to do it now, I guess. So, but we had all these preparations in our mind, but God is always ahead of us. And he's looking to teach us something that we're not prepared for. That's faith. That's faith. And you have this fight as a soldier that goes on in your mind in this battle and this war that happens in your mind because you're thinking, what is going to happen if I lose control of this situation? What is it going to cost me if I do this? How, how am I going to make it through this? And all these fears just crash in around you and you're thinking, what, what's going on in our economy? What's happening in our world? What are we going to do if, 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 if? <laughs> And all these things that we get so concerned about. And it displays a lack of trust in God. It's like the little tea bag illustration. Jim Berg uses it in his book, Changed Into His Image. And he says, you take a, a tea bag and you put it into a, a cup of hot water. And, and it, out of that tea bag comes what's inside that tea bag. You start to see it. And when you and I get into hot, hot water situations, we're like that little tea bag. <laughs> What, what happens with our heart when we get into hot water situations? All of a sudden, what's going on inside of here is a little bit displayed, right? Uh, I start to reveal it with the words that I say and with my actions and my attitudes get effect, are affected and, and people start to see what happens and what's going on in my heart. My heart is, starts to be displayed in hot water situations. And so God's just saying, I'm going to bring along some challenges for you because I want you to see what's going on in your heart. I want you to see where your trust lies. I want you to see where your confidence lies. It tells us in the passage that no soldier of Christ gets entangled in the concerns of this life. It's easy to get distracted. On the way home, <clears throat> we just said, hey guys, uh, let's think through this a little bit because we've come off of uh, a mountaintop experience in life and God's been showing us some different things and it's gonna be really easy to just cruise home, put on the headphones, you know, stay in the hotel and turn on the TV and just like run, race back into the things of this world, right? And to the ideas and, I, and, it, and so how do we keep ourselves accountable to, uh, and these guys did phenomenal. They did great. They, they talked and talked and talked and played card games. They had just a phenomenal time on the way home. And it was tremendous. You know, it'd be easy to just kind of isolate yourselves with all the media stuff that goes on today. But, but, but there's so much value in being a part of each other's lives and to not forgetting and getting, not getting distracted by all the things that are going on. Paul cites in chapter 4 an individual that was with him along in the journey and in the ministry, moving along with him. And he says in chapter 4, in verse 9 and 10, he says, Make every effort to come to me because Demas deserted me 
which tells me that Demas was with him in this ministry endeavor. He was alongside of him at some point, working alongside of him, but it tells us why he deserted him. Why did Demas leave? Because he loved this present world. He, he fell in love with the things of this world and it distracted him and pulled him off course and it took his attention off of the Lord where it should have been. And it's so easy in this life to, keep, to take our attention off Jesus and to get derailed and to look at all the things of this world. And the battle takes place in our mind as a soldier. How do you, how do you not forget the one that is your recruiter, the one who you are seeking to please? And the most important aspect of being a part of this war is making sure that in your mind you are resolved to stay true to Jesus and to keep your focus on him. When you get discouraged... <laughs> and nobody else is around, what do you do? When you get discouraged as a soldier, you put yourself in the shoes of a soldier, and all of a sudden he looks around and he says, where are all my fellow soldiers? Where are they at? You know, and he realizes he's alone. He's in trouble. But you have one another. You have the body of Christ right here so that we don't get discouraged. I have in, in uh, this picture in my mind as we headed up to the top of, uh, of um, Prairie Reef Lookout. And so we went from about 3,000 feet where our base camp was to almost 9,000 feet uh, to the peak of that mountain in a, a linear three and a half mile stretch. It ended up being like six and a half miles of hiking, but it was like in three and a half miles you climbed that many feet. And I just thought, this is not going to be a cakewalk. Uh, and it was, it was difficult. And some had a difficult time. Daniel was really, really struggling. I asked his permission to use uh, the illustration here, and he said absolutely, so he's not here right now. But uh, he was really having a hard time. And in fact, there were times along the path where he just sat down on the ground and he said, I'm just going to take a, I'm just going to sleep right here. I'm, I'm going to take a nap for a while. You know, he's like, I'm done. He's dragging his feet along and he's like, I'm done. And I, and I had to evaluate him for, we had to do a little evaluation. Are you okay? Is there, are you dehydrated? Are you, or is anything hurting? Any, there were no physical pains, no physical problems, nothing going on there. He just said, I'm just tired. I'm just tired. I just want to give up. And so we sat down, we talked to him for a little while and said, Daniel, don't forget what's up there. <laughs> I mean, you are so close. We are so close to the top. Don't forget why we're doing this and the opportunity that you're going to have to be able to see. It was the pinnacle moment, I think, of everybody's experience on that trip is to be at the top of Prairie Reef Lookout and to just see miles all the way into Glacier Park. And we were we were a long ways away from Glacier Park. I mean, all the way back into eastern Montana and to the west, you could see all the way to the Mission Mountains. And, and it was just unbelievable. All the snow-capped mountains along the top up there. Incredible to just see the magnificence of God and the lookout sitting on top of this cliff. It's just a straight drop cliff right down the backside, you know, and you're just standing on that and it just is fearsome to just stand there and feel the wind and just think, I'm close enough. I'm not going any further <laughs> to the edge of this thing. That's good, you know. Uh, if you're afraid of heights, that is not the place for you. That was, a, that was a fearsome step right there to just see the magnificence of God. But when you are on that path like Daniel and you're, you're trudging along and, and you, you think, boy, I'm going to get to the summit. I'm going to get to the top. What's up there? Uh, you get discouraged, and certain friends and, and believers in Jesus Christ along the path can get discouraged along the way, can't they? You see your, your brothers and sisters in Christ get discouraged. What do you do? How do you help them? In Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 10, it says, Woe to him who is alone when he falls and he has no one to help him up. I mean, there was a group of guys that stayed with him and, and helped him to, to, to motivate him and to help move him on and to give him, you know, make sure he had the water they needed or gave him the trekking pole so that he could move ahead and, and get up to the top of the mountain. And he got up there. I said, Daniel, when you get up there, you can sleep for 45 minutes if you want to when you get up there, but then you're going to have to take in the view. And he's like, okay. So I, the sleep, I think, motivated him, but he did. He got up there and I think he fell asleep for like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes or something. But then he got up and he just... He just really was so glad that he made it to the top up there. And I, um, and I say sometimes people that are around us lose heart. And when you see fellow believers that are discouraged as they're on that path, it's just a battle in their mind. 
there's just a struggle in their mind and how do you help them? How do you pour into them the opportunity to, to press on and to convince them that it's worth it? It's worth it to move on. Listen, buddy, you're not gonna wanna miss this. I'm telling you, you wanna be up there. And to those that are along the path here, Jesus is worth it. I'm telling you, he's worth it. You, you gotta live for him. Don't do that. That's the values and the things of this world. You gotta stay away from that because you're gonna get disappointed if you, if you move off into those things. Don't do it. Keep your eyes on Jesus. I'm telling you, it's worth it. It's worth it, right? And, and you pour into your friends, into your loved ones, those who know Jesus, you pour into them the value of living for Christ. And so you have this fight in your mind as a soldier. And secondly, you have this, the finish of an athlete. The finish of an athlete. And the question is, what's going on in your heart? You take a look at, a, at an athlete and you realize the determination and the focus and, and everything that they've poured their life and invested their life into in order to accomplish the goals that they have set in mind uh, to do. Choosing the easy road as an athlete is not a good plan because it will be revealed in the end product, right? If you're choosing shortcuts, it's, it's not going to pay off. Taking the easy road is not, the, is not a good idea. You say, well, it's the most comfortable thing to do right now and it benefits me right now. It's not going to benefit you in the long run. And the purpose of the finish line is keeping our eyes on Jesus and someday to those who love his appearing, we keep our focus on him and someday you're gonna stand before him. And there's a crown of righteousness to those that endure that don't take the shortcuts, that live for him, that do what pleases and honors the Lord. Endurance of an athlete is sustained by what is envisioned at the end, and it's the reward. You take a look at all the training that they do, and they, they start to ask like Daniel did, is this worth it? Is this really worth it? I'm ready to give up. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm so tired. It is worth it. It is worth it. And the finish of an athlete, to keep your eyes and your focus on where it really belongs. We were sitting around the campfire just a couple of nights ago, sharing our thoughts for the day. And it was the first time that all the Wranglers that were with us joined us uh, around the campfire. It was our last campfire night. And uh, they participated in our discussion. And there's a guy named Cliff that came along with us. And he was pretty quiet, not, not really engaged in a lot of the discussions that we had at all. Uh, and I don't think that Cliff knows Jesus. Um, but he uh, kind of, towards the end of our campfire, he said, you know, I have an observation to make. He said, um, I've been watching you guys this week. He said, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of bad things going on in this world. He said, but I watch you guys, these young men right here, he says, and, and he said, I, I think there's hope. <laughs> he said, it gives me hope. I think there's hope. And, and he just saw something different in these young men as they, as they, Treated, how they treated one another, how they conversed with one another, their, their commitment to spending time in God's word and, and to just being a, a confident in what they believed and what they knew. And he said, I, I think there's hope. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's what we're supposed to be living for. You endure and you press on because there's people that need to hear about who Jesus is. And then Paul uses the illustration of the farmer, doesn't he? And I tell you, there's nothing like the faith of a farmer. Uh, who does the hard work to plant the field and put those crops out there and then say, God, <laughs> the rest is yours. I, I can't do anything about what's going to happen with that crop. The rest is yours. You're, you're going to have to bring the rain. You're going to have to bring the elements and the weather to, to produce what needs to be produced. And the faith of a farmer. And uh, the first day that we were out there, I already, already told you the story, but uh, 8.30 at night, there's no horses. <laughs> And I'm thinking, what are we going to do? We got to come up with a shelter. Uh, so what kind of food do you guys have? Because we can survive on the food we have. We're, nobody's going to starve to death. We're going to be just fine. Uh, but we, got, we don't have our tents because all of our tents were on the horses. We got to come up with some sort of a shelter. All of our sleeping, most of our sleeping bags. I mean, what are we going to do here? And uh, the guys were like, we could build a lean-to. We could build a lean-to. And I think what happened was these guys watched about 20 episodes of Man vs. Wild and Bear Gryllis eating grubs and everything. And they just, we can do this, you know? And they put their mind to it. And in about 20 minutes, they had every little kid's dream lean-to. 14-man lean-to hut covered with pine boughs and branches. I, I wish I could show you the picture. It's unbelievable, this lean-to hut. You know, we get this thing finished. And we're like, dude, we're going to make it through the night. This is going to be great, you know? And then the horse pulls up and like camps a mile back that way. And we're like, 
all right, guys, put your gear on. We're going. So uh, we headed out. But what I was impressed with was their faith. There was nobody that complained. Oh, what are we going to do? And we just saw it. All their minds went together to work to say, we can do this. And they built that lean-to in an incredible amount of time. And it was unbelievable what their minds were prepared to do and, uh, and their faith exercised in, in just saying, we can, we can accomplish this together. We can do this. And when times of doubt close in around you, what do you cling to? When times of doubt crash in around you, where's your confidence? Where's your hope? And the faith of a farmer says that, that he does the work with his hands, but he trusts the Lord's with the results. He trusts the Lord with what's going to come. And uh, maybe this gives you a little bit of help in the trials and the difficulties that you might face in your life. Can I just pray with you this morning as we close? God, we, uh, we thank you for the opportunity this week to have our faith exercised. That uh, in the days to come, we would not forget the things that you have taught us that our confidence and our trust would be in you. I pray that you would help us uh, to fight as a soldier, uh, to have uh, uh, the faith of a farmer, and to finish this race strong as, as athletes, that uh, we would just have confidence and hope and trust in you. And we pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Once again, we th want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.